Thanks, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with an overview sorry about that, um, of copyright, um, open access, Creative Commons licenses, and then try to tie all those together in the context of the publishing process, whether you're coming to this as an author or as an editor or manager of a journal. Um, I know we've got folks in the audience with sort of varying levels of copyright experience. I recognize the number of names on the attendance list. Um, I am going to start with a fairly basic intro to copyright. It might be redundant for some of you, but bear with me. I think that's the foundation to kind of tying all of this together um, and getting a good grounding in, in some of the things to think about in the publishing process. Um, as Joanna mentioned, we'll have time for questions at the end, but do throw them in the chat at any time. Um, sometimes it's easier for me to jump to a question while I'm still on that topic, so I'll try to do that where I can, but we will have plenty of time at the end as well. And um, because I'm speaking about an area of law, I have a couple of disclaimers to start. First is that I am not a lawyer, so nothing I'm sharing today should be considered legal advice. Um, and then the second thing, which Joanna also mentioned, is that I'm speaking to you from the Canadian context. So Canada's copyright laws might be different in a variety of ways from those in other countries. And you do want to ensure that you're working within the laws of the country that you're working in. Um, okay, so with that, we're going to jump into this. So copyright is the legal framework that provides protection for literary works which actually just means most written things, not necessarily just what we think of as literature, um, dramatic works, musical works, and artworks, as well as sound recordings, performances, and communication signals. These types of works, as we call them, need to be fixed in some format to be protected. So you might have the idea for the next great Canadian novel, you might be planning character um, development and plot outlines, but until you actually write that down or start typing it or, or, or record your voice or something, um, it's not protected. So, But once you do start writing it or you start sketching the drawing or taking the photo, that's when it becomes protected by copyright. Um, so copyright provides the copyright owner with the sole right to do the things you see listed here. So things like copy the work, publish, translate, adapt it, and so on, including at the bottom the right to grant permission to others to do these things with your work. Doing any of these things with a work without the permission of the copyright owner uh, might be copyright infringement and most likely is copyright infringement, which is illegal and can result in a lawsuit. Um, that said, the Copyright Act does include a number of exceptions, or in other words, users' rights, that do permit the use of copyright-protected materials in certain ways, in certain circumstances. Um, it's not directly relevant to us today to get into these, but I just want to let people know that copyright is not necessarily the kind of solid brick wall it can seem like. Um, okay, so I've been talking about the copyright owner. Let's talk about who that is. Generally, the person or people who created the work own the copyright, um, so that would be the author or co-authors, the artist, the composer, and so on. In some employment cases, though, the employer will automatically own copyright in the works that their employees create as part of the job, unless their contract states something different. Um, and an author or another copyright owner can assign or transfer their copyright to someone else. This is pretty common in a lot of types of publishing, in the music industry, and elsewhere. Copyright comes into effect immediately and automatically. So as I said, as soon as you start writing that great Canadian novel, it's protected. Okay? In Canada, you don't need to register your copyright with the government, though that is an option and can provide some extra assurance in the event that someone challenges your right to that work. And finally, copyright doesn't uh, last forever. It does expire. And in Canada, and quite a few other countries, it currently lasts for the life of the creator plus 70 years. In the case of co-creators, such as co-authors, it will last for the longer of the, the author's lives, the longest, at plus 70 years. And if ownership of copyright is transferred to a publisher or someone else or is owned by an employer, the term of copyright is actually still based on the creator's life. The term doesn't change and doesn't transfer to that new owner. Um, okay, so in open access, the goal is to make work available to others to not only read freely, but to be able to reuse, 
and revise and customize the work as well. So these five R's kind of sum up the intentions behind open access. Users should be able to keep copies of the work, reuse it in various ways, adapt and modify it to suit their needs, customize it by mixing it with their own content, and then share those revised and remixed versions. And in open access publishing, the five R's are often or typically achieved by applying a Creative Commons or CC license to the work. There are six different Creative Commons licenses. They range from more to less open. You can see them on the, in the graphic on the right here. Um, I'll just mention that at the top of this chart, there is a PD icon and also a CC0. Uh, those are not really licenses. They're a little bit different and not typically used in publishing. So we're going to ignore those for today. But then the next six that you see listed there are the various Creative Commons licenses. Um, they're listed from most to least open, followed by all rights reserved at the bottom. Um, all rights reserved just means full copyright, no open licenses applied. This is obviously not an open access option. So those six different licenses are made up of various combinations of four different conditions or parameters that you see listed on the left here. So by means attribution and requires the creator to be credited anytime the work is used. This is a requirement in all CC licenses. It's also obviously very common in publishing and in academia, it's something we're all pretty practiced with. Um, SA means share alike and requires that if you modify or adapt the work, you then also have to apply the share alike license to your own resulting work from that, um, which is intended to perpetuate the openness that's behind CC licenses. Um, NC means non-commercial and obviously prohibits any commercial use of the work. And ND means no derivatives and prohibits making any adaptations to the work. You can see on the chart that the licenses with ND in them are at the bottom. They only really allow resharing of the content, so they're not very open. Um, they're not used typically in open access publishing because of that limitation on revising or adapting the work. So those four conditions are combined to create the six different licenses. For example, you can see in the middle there, CC by NCSA or attribution, non-commercial share alike. Um, we are focusing on publishing today, so we're talking about written works, but I'll just mention that CC licenses can be applied to any type of copyright protected work, so images, music, and so on. In the context of a journal, a CC license could be applied article by article. So if you're an editor, you might give authors a choice, either from the full list of six um, or from a subset that you pre-select. Like for example, you might leave out the ND or no derivatives options. Um, or you can decide to have the same license applied to all of the content in the journal. As an author, if you're given a choice of licenses, you'll really want to think about how you want others to be able to use your work, if there are any limitations you want to put on that and make your choice that way. Or if there's only one license for the whole journal, you'll still want to think about whether that's an option that makes sense for you and, and works for you. Um, so when a CC license is applied, the icons on the, in that graphic on the last slide typically appear on the article or whatever type of work it is, um, along with a link to the license summary, which is what you see on the right here. Um, this example is for the attribution non-commercial license, and you can see that it just describes in really clear, plain language what you can do with the work and any limitations um, or restrictions on that. At CC also has a machine readable version of each license. Um, that can be embedded in the code for a document or a web page, which just makes um, searching easier. That's sort of a back end thing to think about. And then there's a more detailed legal code version of each license, which doesn't need to be included on the work itself, but it's available as a reference for anyone who wants to dig into the, the actual legalese and the, the information that underpins the licenses. So, it's really important to understand what these licenses permit others to do with your work before you decide which one to use or which one to select for your journal as a whole on behalf of your authors. Um, you want to think about what it means to make your work openly available online. It's not just letting people read it, but thinking about how they might reuse, remix, or repurpose the work, um, both within and beyond your community or your field. Um, how open a license are you comfortable with? Are you excited to see what those other options or what things might come out of it? That can be really great. 
um, but are there any limits you want to place on what others can do with that work? So Creative Commons has a license chooser tool that walks you through a series of questions, um, basically addressing each of those conditions or parameters and has you really think about how you want the work to be able to be used. And then it'll recommend a license based on, um, based on what you've input into that. So that can be a good starting point. Um, and finally, once you've decided which license you're going to use, you wanna make sure you're using it consistently. This is maybe particularly for editors or managers of journals. Um, for example, you want to make sure it's included on the web page of the journal and or the article, as well as on the PDFs of the articles themselves, so that if people come to that PDF separate from the website, they're still understanding, able to understand how the article can be used. Um, you also want to make sure you're not including any contradictory information, like don't include an all rights reserved statement, because you're not reserving all rights if you're using an open license. So just make sure all of your messaging and all of your information um, is there for people and is consistent throughout. Um, and then finally, there are a few other key things to know when you're using Creative Commons licenses. The licenses provide upfront permission for users to do a variety of things with the work without having to contact the copyright owner for permission. But first, users can still ask the copyright owner for permission to do something that isn't within the terms of the license. For example, if you apply a license with a non-commercial restriction, someone could still ask you for permission to make a commercial use or use it in some for-profit type of way. You could decide as the copyright owner whether or not to allow that. Um, and then that use would actually be governed by whatever agreement, whatever terms, whatever contract um, you put in place for that use, not by the CC license. Um, the CC license uh, is for users is basically what I'm getting at here, right? It's not intended to restrict what the copyright owner can do with the work. You still have all of the rights under copyright that copyright owners have. Um, it's intended to be sort of outward facing and let users know how they can and can't use that content. Um, and next, users can always use the exceptions that are in the Copyright Act. So if those exceptions allow them to do something that maybe isn't clearly permitted by the CC license, they can still go ahead and do it. CC licenses um, are not intended to restrict user rights any more than the copyright regime in any given country would. Um, and then finally, it's important to understand that CC licenses are irrevocable, meaning you can't change them. Um, you can't change your mind once you apply a specific license to a work. You could pull the article offline and repost it with a different CC license on it or without a license at all. Um, but do keep in mind that anyone who still has a copy of that with that, with that original license on it um, or who has already used it under the terms of that previous license still has the right to use it in those ways. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit from the licenses themselves. Um, you or the authors you're working with, depending on what your role is, might want to include third party content in an article. This is pretty common. Um, by third party content, I mean anything created by someone else. So this could be figures, maps, photos, screenshots, poems, or a piece of music, or anything else that someone else created. Um, you need to consider how a specific work fits into your plans to publish the article under an open license. If that work, that third party work is protected by copyright and not openly licensed, you might need permission, you probably need permission from the copyright owner to include it. If you do get permission to include it, um, you wanna be really clear in the caption for that figure or somewhere in, in the, the footnotes or the text of your article that it's not covered by the CC license that covers your article as a whole. This does though make things complicated for readers or users who may want to reuse or revise or remix that article because they either have to remove that content or they would have to go back to that copyright owner and also request permission for whatever their new use is. Um, this does interfere kind of with those five R's and the intentions of making your work open, accessible, and reusable. So ideally, you want to think about looking for images or other content that is also openly licensed. Um, it might have a different license from what you've got on the article. And in that case, you want to be really clear to indicate that this image is under this license, 
whereas the article as a whole is under this other license, readers and users will still have to do some um, thinking through whether they can reuse that content in the same in the way that they want to, but it's just so much more likely to be possible or to be okay for them to do that than it is with a fully um, copyright protected, not openly licensed work. Um, I'll also mention you could look for content in which copyright has expired, um, but keeping in mind copyright lasts for the life of the creator plus 70 years, so that's likely to be older material. Uh, valuable in some circumstances or some fields and less valuable in others, but once copyright expires, there are no longer any restrictions or limitations on how the work can be used, so you could go ahead and include that as well. Okay, so I'm going to jump into publishing agreements or publishing contracts. Um, I'll just mention that a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is also covered in the OJS guide that we've got on our resources slide. I think Joanna is going to put the link in the chat um, at some point. So there is a, a resource there for some of this, this information. So there are basically two different ways copyright can be handled in a publishing contract. The author first can transfer ownership of copyright to the publisher in which case the publisher then has all the rights that we saw listed early on that belong to the copyright owner. When it's done this way, in scholarly publishing at least, the, the publisher will often or usually grant some rights back to the author in that contract. For example, usually um, scholarly type uses. So for example, the author might be permitted to go ahead and make copies of the article for teaching or to include the article in their thesis or dissertation if they're a grad student, that kind of thing. But to do anything else that isn't either clearly assigned back to the author in the contract or um, permitted by this, the open license that's applied, the author would need to contact the publisher and request permission, just like any other user would have to do. Um, and then related to this, a bit of a logistical consideration, if you are an editor or manager of a journal, um, there is there, there's a level of responsibility needing to handle and respond to any incoming requests from people wanting to do use that article in certain ways. If you're the copyright owner, that's your responsibility. Um, the other option is where the author keeps ownership of copyright and just transfers certain rights to the publisher. So the publisher gets the right to publish, to distribute, maybe to translate or other related things, while the author retains all the rest of the rights. This can be done as an exclusive or a non-exclusive agreement. Exclusive basically means that's the only place the author can publish that article, um, except as permitted by the CC license. And non-exclusive means the author can also enter into an agreement or a contract somewhere else to publish or distribute the work. Um, those are maybe less of an issue with open access because the CC licenses do allow so much, but it's something to think about when you're developing these agreements. So in open access publishing, typically the author will retain copyright and only transfer to the publisher the specific rights needed to publish the article and make it available. Um, so if you're creating a journal or managing a journal, you'll want to think about all the various ways that you will need to copy and use the article in order to manage the publishing process. And this is both at the front end and the back end. Um, this could include things like reformatting because you're going to want the PDF version and maybe an HTML version. It could include making backup copies, taking excerpts to use for promotional purposes. Again, maybe you are translating in the context of your journal and so on. Make sure that those are all covered by the terms of the contract or the agreement um, so that you don't have to go back to the author for, for permission to do something that you missed. The agreement might also specify that the journal has the right of first publication, which just means any reuse or republication by the author would have to wait until after this version has been made available and would have to cite this journal as the original, um, the original publication source. There could also be an embargo period, which is a certain amount of time that needs to pass before the author is allowed to republish or redistribute the article somewhere else. However, that's pretty uncommon with open access publishing, again, just because the CC licenses would allow um, a lot of that type of activity anyway. And then finally, the publishing agreement will probably also specify which CC license is going to be applied to the article. Again, whether that's the, the one CC license that is used for everything in this journal or whether 
um, authors were given a choice. It would it would enumerate in there which one has been selected. Um, do you remember that only the copyright owner can apply a CC license? So if copyright is transferred to the publisher, um, they would be able to do that. So the contract would essentially just have the author acknowledge that the publisher is going to apply this license. Um, if copyright is retained by the author, the author is the one who's able to apply the license. So the contract would include an agreement from the author to let the journal apply that license on their behalf when it's published. Um, that brings me to the end of the sort of copyright and related overview. Here are a handful of links. We are going to, uh, the recording will be available, so you'll have these. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Maria to show you where all of this information actually comes into play when you're working in OJS and, and give us a bit of a demo. So over to you. Everyone, and uh, thank you, Jen, for this great overview of copyright and licensing. Uh, I don't have slides. I'm going to share my screen in a moment and show you where to set up all of these things in OJS. So just give me one moment to do that. All right. Can I get a thumbs up that you are able to see my screen? Great. Thank you. OK. So. Um, I am going to be doing my demo on um, OJS uh, version 3.3, but the same functionality uh, has been carried over to 3.4 if you're using the most recent version. And this demo will probably be most useful to journal managers and editors who need to set up copyright licensing in OJS, as well as to librarians and other staff who may be supporting journals. But I also hope that some of it will be useful to those of you in the audience who may be submitting authors or regular readers who need to know how to reuse content. And uh, don't feel the pressure to remember everything I'm going to say because all of this, all of these instructions are available in the OJS guide that uh, Joanna put in the chat. All right, so before I jump into the settings, I just wanted to outline that when we talk about communicating your copyright licensing information on your OJS journal, we usually keep several stakeholders or several use cases in mind. So we need to tell potential authors under which conditions they can publish in the journal. We need to tell uh, submitting authors when they are making their submission, um, what conditions to accept, whether it's a copyright agreement or a license. We need to tell readers how to reduce materials and we also need to embed our licensing and copyright information in metadata for use of downstream services like Crossref or DOAJ or search engines or indexes. So I'm going to go over all of those use cases um, so that um, we can see each one of them in action. So the first one uh, is potential authors. So uh, if I'm an author coming to the journal, I want to submit, I need to know under which conditions I will be making the submission and what rights I will retain. Maybe it's relevant for my uh, funding requirement or for my uh, employer's requirement, etc. So OJS automatically provides you with an option to do that under your submissions page. This is an automatically generated page from your submission preparation checklist and your author guidelines that you add in the back end. And one of the automatically added portions here is your copyright notice. So in order for this copyright notice to appear on this page, you will need to add it in the back end. And I'm going to jump into my dashboard here and show you where it is. So under workflow, author guidelines, we have the section where we would add our author guidelines, and then we have a section where we would add our copyright notice. So whatever text you add here is the text that will appear automatically on the submission page. This is also the text that will be presented to your submitting authors to accept. So this text is really meant for authors, so you can write it with an eye to let authors know uh, about conditions that they're accepting, the license, the reuse, the self-archiving, so anything that they need to know and agree to. Now, um, sometimes I know that journals feel that the um, this submissions page may get maybe getting too long with all of the instructions, so they want to 
separate the copyright notice out onto a separate page, maybe separate the privacy statement out onto a separate page, which is perfectly fine to do. You can do it through your navigation menu options by creating a static page and linking it from up here. But just remember that the text that you have in the settings is the text that will be presented to your author. So you still want to have it there, right? Um, and uh, you can also have this information displayed, for example, in your footer in more generic sense than this journal publishes under CC by license, for example, or have it in your sidebar through a sidebar block. Uh, I'm not going to go over those in details. These are just different options. But the default is to add it to your workflow author guidelines right here. So now let's talk about what submitting authors would see. As I mentioned, it would be the same text. So if I were to go and start a submission, it will be shown right here on the first page at the bottom. So the text of the license is displayed for me here. And in order for me to agree to it, I need to click yes, I agree to abide by the terms of this copyright statement. Now, because most journals that use OJS are open access journals. And as Jan pointed out, in most cases, they would be using a Creative Commons license, author would be retaining copyright. So what OJS does is offers you a simple click through license. So you, you check the chat box, you're pretty much done. And depending on the jurisdiction you're in, a license doesn't have to be written. It can be verbal, it can be click through. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a document that you sign. But if you operate a journal that does require copyright transfer, then you do want to have it signed over in a more formal way. Or maybe sometimes you don't do copyright transfer, but you still want to have a document to be signed. Maybe your author needs to have it signed by their employer uh, or by whoever is authorized to sign on their behalf who is not the author themselves. Anyways, you need a document. Or just don't really have any sophisticated signing workflow. But what you can do is you can upload this document um, under your publisher libraries. Here it's on the workflow, publisher library. So you can upload it into any bucket. The buckets are really just for you. And what it will give you is a link that you can make public by checking the public access checkbox and then use this link and add it, for example, to your email template um, that you use when recording the editorial decision to accept the article. So let's do that. Under my emails, um, I'm going to find that template. So editor decision accept. Uh, this is a very basic out of the box template. You probably want to customize it anyways. Uh, and one of the things you can add here, if you do want your authors to sign some sort of a document, is the link that we just created in the publisher library and instructions to the author on what to do with this document. Once again, this is for scenarios when you need to have a document signed. It is probably probably would not apply to the majority of journals that just use a Creative Commons license and allow authors to retain their copyright. All right, so uh, now let's talk about our readers. So. Our readers, when they uh, come across the journal, when they read an article, they need to know how to reuse it. So Jen talked to us about different types of Creative Commons licenses. And there is a way to have your license automatically added to your article, like it's done here, for example. There is a CC BY license added, as well as copyright statement is also automatically stamped on an article. So you have an option to do that at the journal wide level or per individual article. So I will show you where those settings live. We're going back to the dashboard. And these settings live under your uh, distribution settings. Oh, sorry. There we go, a little bit slow. So under your distribution settings, uh, you can specify who will hold the copyright in the journal, whether it's an author or a journal or some other entity, which you can add here. You can select which license you're going to be using. The Creative Commons licenses are pre-populated here, but you can also add a different kind of license and its URL. You can select what the copyright year will be recorded based on the issue publication date or article publication date. 
And finally, you can add license terms here that will be displayed on the article landing page next to the license. Now, in my case, what I added here doesn't really um, add any additional information. It's the same CC BY license, but you may need to add some additional provisions here. This is the license for readers. So as I mentioned earlier, this is OGS 3.3. If you're using 3.1 or earlier, there was only one license uh, text box that was both for readers and for authors. Um, since OGS 3.2, it's been separated into two. So um, you can provide kind of a more detailed license slash agreement text for authors and more clear and user-friendly instructions for your readers. So when we go to publish an article, here I'm going to grab an article that is already in production and go to publication tab. My permissions are displayed under the permissions and disclosure section. And you can see that the system is telling me that copyright will be automatically assigned to the author. The copyright year will be set when the issue is published and the license will be set automatically to CC BY. These are the terms that we just set journal-wide at the distribution level, <clears throat> excuse me, but you can override them at an individual level and you can change the license or you can change the copyright holder, you can add a different copyright holder, et cetera. Um, and this information that you enter here will be added to your article metadata that will then travel downstream to services like Crossref, DOAJ, OpenAir, and will um, inform those for the services how the article can be reused. But as we all know, when you find an article online and you save it on your computer, it will forever be separated from the metadata that you publish on your website. And for that reason, it is very important to also have your copyright and licensing statement on the article itself as Jennifer already mentioned. So here, for example, is my PDF galley, and I've added the statement and the license at the bottom of the page. Of course, you can make it work with your article template in a way that is most organic for your journal. Um, so I think that is it for my demo. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to pass this back to Joanna to facilitate our question and answer period. Yeah, thanks very much, Maria. Thanks very much, Jen. This was great. Um, and I hope everyone thinks uh, the same. Uh, overview of copyright meeting practical demonstration in OJS from my perspective. So thanks again. Um, and there is one question I can see in the chat at the moment. Uh, thank you for the question from Taylor McPeak. Um, she says, um, thank you for your insights as al always, Jennifer. I know this can be a complicated issue for several reasons, but what are your thoughts and or experience on including AI generated content, text, visuals, etc., in OA publications? Thank you for your question, Taylor. Good question. It is complicated. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a totally firm answer at this point. Um, as many of us know, AI is still quite up in the air. There are, I don't think there are cases in Canada yet. There are a number of cases in the States. The Canadian government is undertaking a consultation right now on how we should deal with AI. So a lot of this is sort of unclear at the moment. Um, the safest, I guess, things to look for if you are using AI to, to generate images or content is to uh, make sure that the terms of use on the platform or the program you're using um, give you the rights. So there's no dispute or discrepancy there on, on the outputs, I mean. Um, and you could also consider only using openly licensed content as inputs or as you know, the material that you're putting into to sort of inspire or provide the basis for whatever the output is. That's going to be your clearest and most straightforward way to use AI, because then you know that everything involved is either openly licensed or the rights have come to you where there are any rights. Um, beyond that, I don't know that I can give specific advice. I think we just need to kind of wait and see how things shape up in this field. Um, I know that's not super helpful. Hopefully it's a start. 
Yeah, I think definitely it's a start. Um, I don't know if uh, Taylor would like to comment further or anyone else would like to add to that. Um, or if there are any other questions or comments, um, you please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or uh, type your question, either using Q&A or the chat provided. I just wanted to add to the AI question that many publishers these days come up with policies and make them available on their websites uh, regarding the use of AI generated content, as well as regarding the authorship and whether AI could be listed as an author. So I recommend that if you are looking to publish, check your um, check the author guidelines that the publisher made available for those specific provisions. Yeah, thanks, Maria. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for also pointing out to the great resource from McGill that was shared with you. Okay, we'll take a look. Thanks for sharing it with us, um, our uh, McGill colleagues. We'll take a look. Um, okay, if any other questions or comments or um, anything that crosses your mind today, we have um, about 40 participants today, so... Pretty sure there are more questions or comments. And yes, thanks for sharing further resources in the chat, uh, Taylor. I did share the resources that are going to be on the slides, but just in case, um, yeah, feel free to add more resources as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess I see a clap. I don't see a uh, raise hand, but uh, feel free, Sidar, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask anything <laughs> about copyright and OJS. Okay, uh, we'll just wait a bit to see if there are more questions or if anyone would like to add anything. Um, how about I, I'll 